Corbis, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk with you. Have you seen, with all the work that you're doing on future issues, uh, a, a sea change in people's thinking about how we're going to deal with the post-COVID-19 era? Well, what I've seen is um, we're in this period of reaction where a lot of things in these kind of crises, the first phase is this kind of reveal, where a lot of things that were hidden before that were sort of missed are being blasted away. They're coming out. So we're in this period where these myths are kind of falling by the wayside. So things like the, we're seeing that inadequacy of our public health care system. We're seeing how precarious a lot of work is. We're seeing how our supplies change, uh, these global supplies change are pretty brittle. So all of these things are being revealed right now. And I think after that period, we think at the Institute for the Future in terms of kind of three phases of this kind of crisis. The first one is this we're in right now, reaction and reveal. The second one is a reset where we have a little bit of a time to think about what does it all mean? How did we get here? Who is responsible? Why did it happen? What do we do that this doesn't happen again? And then the third phase of the crisis is hopefully reinvention, where we start thinking about, okay, what do we do today and tomorrow to prevent something like this from happening? So we're kind of, I think where we are right now is moving from this process of sort of reaction and reveal to hopefully reassess, reevaluate. We already see the Congress acting, and, and you know, in terms of, of a stimulus program, in terms of trying to rescue small businesses and so forth and so on. Will uh, will other sectors of our uh, of our economy uh, be stepping up as well to try to figure out how do they reinvent themselves? I think that's what's going to start happening. I think we're beginning to see that where people are starting to think about what does it mean for me? What do I do? How do I prepare for this kind of future, new future, the new normal? Or what do I need to create? What do I need to reinvent to build a better future? So I think that's we're seeing beginnings of that. Let's get a little granular here. Let's let's say some of the I, I think I sent you some of the key points I wanted to discuss. For example, gig workers and hourly workers, that type of thing. They're the ones who are hurting right now because they've been put out of work. Is there anything that they can do, anything that uh, you know society can do to address their you know their being so fragile as, as we've as seen you know from this pandemic? Yeah, I think one of the things that we're seeing that we've been talking about for a long time is that. There's nothing inherently terrible about gig work or on-demand work. What's really not good about it is that it comes with no assets. It comes with no benefits, the kind of long-term resources that you need for security, where it doesn't allow you to have ownership in the company stock, um, in, in companies or platforms that you work for. It doesn't give you health benefits. It doesn't give you sick leave and, and family leave and all kinds of other benefits. So I think this is something that definitely is being revealed big, big time and something we need to deal with the fact that it's not just gig work but a lot of workers in the u.s uh, cannot afford the basic necessities that they do not have access to these basic assets like health care like uh, savings like ownership in in companies in the in which they work does this imply that there needs to be a total look at the structure of how the workplace works or is, do we need a better social safety net for these individuals? I think it's both. I think we, we need to rethink our safety net. We need to rethink the value of things like health and public health. We've conceived it as a private good. And what we're finding out is that there is no such thing as private health. The, my health is dependent on the health of the homeless person I'm next to. So. In fact, all health is public health, and we haven't treated it like that. So I think the safety net, the issues of benefits and how we provide the safety net for this kind of new economy that's much more on demand, that's much more to relies on kind of gift work and other things, I think we need to rethink our safety net big time. How will we, how will we advance that agenda? Is it through spending? Is it through creating new ideas of how we can protect each other? Well, I think some of the things like healthcare, for example, the notion of universal healthcare that's been proposed by several candidates and platforms, uh, some form of universal health coverage should be universal. 
it shouldn't be something that's a private good. So I think that's going to be probably, hopefully, we're going to address that. The issue of benefits and who supplies those benefits, whether it's companies or whether these should be government benefits. In a lot of European countries, your benefits are not tied to your employment. So that needs to be rethought. And I think these things are beginning to happen. They're beginning to happen at the state level in California, and hopefully some of this will happen at the federal level. Do you foresee a fundamental change in how retail and how brick and mortar uh, emerges from this pandemic? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that retail, the, the issues with retail have been uh, with us for the last probably five years, which is there's been a lot of issues with retail um, economy and a lot of stores closing down. So in many ways, this crisis has accelerated that. Um, so I, and given that a lot of the workforce, 4 million people are involved in retail, this is why we're seeing such huge unemployment numbers. I think it does pre present huge challenges. The, the question is, okay, if retail workforce goes down, where, where are those people needed? And it looks like a lot of them are needed in healthcare. Of course, the, the issue that retail is facing also to some degree is a real estate problem. But what about Silicon Valley companies that have so much real estate and they keep expanding their campuses and you know, the Google complex in downtown San Jose, for example, with the, with the distributed workforce and the work from home model that has suddenly emerged because of the pandemic, are we going to see a reevaluation of do we need to have all these centralized campuses? Do we need to rethink about our land use? Yeah, I hope so. I'm not sure that that's going to be happening, particularly for large companies, because they're sitting on huge amounts of cash that they can invest in these large facilities. And to what degree they're really needed for work and to, to what degree their status symbols and ways to provide all kinds of benefits to their workers, like the gym and hairdresser and all these other kinds of things. But clearly for a lot of people, this crisis is bringing to the fore that maybe we don't need to go to work and into an office nine to five. There are other ways of working. So I think it's probably, hopefully what where we're gonna come out is much more nuanced understanding of when do you need to be in the office and when can you work online? Do you think our tech sector is going through some reevaluation of its values? in terms of uh, they're stepping up, for example, and making face shields. They're making, they're fine, you know, they're shipping in face masks in China on private planes. Uh, the social good is, is suddenly a very important agenda item for them. Is this going to change their perspective from being less introspective and more society oriented? Well, I hope so. And a lot of these companies have really good social agendas and want to help. But there are other elements of it that I'm not sh that need to change. Also, for example, taxes and paying taxes, so that we have resources to put into healthcare and we have resources to put into education and our infrastructure. So, you know, responding to a crisis is one thing, but being consistently promoting the kind of agenda that the enables more equitable growth is ultimately where we need to be. Tell me about your labs and what, what, is, what's the, what are they going to be focusing on as you uh, go through this multi-stage emergence from uh, the pandemic? Well, we're looking at developing some scenarios for post-pandemic scenarios, and we're not focusing so much on COVID-19, although that's part of it. But 12 years ago, the Institute has created these scenarios, which involved pandemics like this, where we it was clear that because of climate change, because of population growth, because of kind of global mobility, and that we're all connected, it's much more likely that we will be experiencing pandemics like this more frequently. So we're looking at what are some of the scenarios that are possible post-pandemic, when we're in this process of reinvention. What can we do and how do we do that? So the Institute for the Future, we're basically developing these scenarios with an understanding that a lot of, when we think about the future, the future is not predetermined. It's not a given. We create our future by the actions we're taking, by the decisions we're making. The kind of future we're living in today, right now, is based on choices and decisions that were made probably decades ago and more recently. So the ultimate question that we want to pose to everybody is, and I think everybody should be involved in this conversation about 
what kind of future do we want to live in? What kind of future do we want to create? And what can we do to promote that vision of that desirable future? So we're very much focused on developing some scenarios, but also giving people tools so that communities and organizations and educational institutions can come together and have this conversation around what kind of future do we want to build and what's in our capacity to do today. What do you think the mixture will be as we move forward uh, in terms of either innovation or relying on models of the past, successes of the past as our path to the future? Well, we, there's lots of, you know, in futures thinking, you're thinking as much about history as you're thinking about the future. So we're looking back a lot, looking at the depression of the stock market crash of 29, and then what happened during the New Deal. And um, so I think it's really helpful to be looking at patterns of the future, but the patterns of the future never totally repeat themselves. They're patterns, but they're happening in a very, very different environment. So clearly part of future thinking involves understanding those patterns, but also understanding what the environment and conditions we're living in today and what is the signals of the future that we're seeing around us today to build that future. Lastly, do you think we have the, the uh, presence of mind to think long-term as opposed to short-term solutions to get us through this crisis? Boy, this is something we've been trying to battle at the Institute for the Future for our whole existence over 50 years, which is, you know, BBC Futures said that short-termism is the greatest existential threat to humanity. And we truly believe that. And the problem is that we created systems, economic systems and others where rewards are given to short term. So if you think about business decisions and business choices, you, your rewards are based on how your stock price is doing. You know, if you cut costs, if you eliminate workers, your stock price goes up. You know, our politicians are focused on the next election. Our educational institutions are all based on grades and tests, a lot of them, uh, rather than deep learning. So we've really created a system where rewards are given to the short term. And I think the big question for us, and I think the question we want to address is how do we put these incentives and rewards for long-term thinking, and not just long-term thinking, because there are people who are thinking long-term, but rewards for acting on the basis of that long-term. So what is the correlation between innovation and being able to think long-term? Well, I think it's, it's critical if you're innovating and you, you have to take into account the long term. You have to understand what are the implications of your innovations, not just today, but 10 years from now. Uh, what kind of things will be needed? You know, what, what would make people's lives better? So I think it's ab absolutely critical to innovation is the ability to sh think long term. I hope that we can link uh, up with some uh, with, link up with you in the future because what you've said is only the beginning of an important discussion, and I think there's yeah. a lot that we can yeah. can focus on in the future. Are there individual labs we should be focusing on? Uh, our labs yeah. uh, within um, the Equitable Futures Lab is really focused on future of work. Uh, we have a food lab um, that I think it's interesting. You know, in this work that we're doing, developing scenarios, we're bringing all of our labs in. So it's connecting health, and w which we're seeing now that econ economics and health are, are tightly connected. So I, I think our health lab, our equitable futures, our food lab, and then the other lab that we have that's really interesting is uh, digital intelligence which is looking at sort of disinformation and online like computational propaganda. How I think that's another piece of this complex story is that um, competing narratives around what it is, what is the cause, what is the solution, and people are having trouble figuring out what, what sources to trust because we've had this period of sort of mistrusting major institutions, some of the media, uh, so it's a really important part of the conversation. Do the labs cross cross uh, purposes at all? And oh, know. absolutely. Uh, so, silos. Oh no, both. Uh, looking at specific things, you know, when this um, started happening, I was actually reading a report we we're doing on for a school we're working with, the Columbia School of Public Health, 
on the future of public health and the school. And one of the striking things, the first thing that came out is that in the last 10 years, the number of public health workers has gone down from 250,000 to fewer than 200,000, right? So you're seeing that the public health system has been really diminished in many ways. And, and even with that, with those, among those people, many of them are planning to retire. So here in California, we have this health corps now and people are coming out of retirement to become volunteers. But um, it's, it's really interesting, the connection between that and the timing of working on the future of public health and this particular epidemic. So people who've been in public health, they understand, they understood the dangers of this. But yes, the, the labs are very connected. Now, the example you just gave about public health seems to be like a wake-up wake up call. Has, is COVID-19 sort of giving you an opportunity to get people to really focus on all these individual issues or that, that affect society? Or, or complex issues that are kind of tied together. You know, one of the banes of being a futurist is you wake up every day and you look around and if something happens, you go, oh my God, told you so. So, you know, we, we published a report on zoonotic um, disease. So zoonotic diseases are diseases that are transmitted from animals to humans, right? Like avian flu, like COVID-19 now. And we just, you could see, as I said, because of the population growth, because of climate change, because of global connectivity, the likelihood of these kinds of pandemics goes up. So we published this 12 years ago in 08. And then in 09, we did a massive um, online kind of simulation game experience called Superstruct, where we asked people how they would live during these super threats like a pandemic. And we actually created the disease called REDS, which is respiratory distress syndrome. And people for a month shared what they did and the kind of action. They actually lived this experience. And it was fascinating. So yes, people knew about it. The experts knew about it. We're missing this connection between knowing and doing, right? Like the futurists know about it. The experts, the epidemiologists know about it. But how do you get people to act on something that's not immediate, that's not something that's short term? This is kind of, um, I would say, a vulnerability in our larger system that ultimately we need to fix. What do you think the danger is that if we have a respite from this COVID-19 uh, pandemic and say for you know, later this summer or this fall, but then there's, and will it lull us into a sense of security that, okay, the problem's over, we just go back to life as it was. Or if there's a second wave next winter, will it be a major setback for us in terms of planning long run? Yeah, and I think it was yesterday. I haven't seen it, but uh, I read something that Dr. Fauci came out and said that it might be not something that ends, that it might be a cyclical thing that comes back. And, um, you know, the longer it lasts, the more we change our sort of behavior patterns and we adapt to it. Like if you think about 9 11, I don't know if you remember, but I remember flying where you didn't have to go through TSA and screening and you can bring pr pretty much anything, right? Like that seems insane right now and we're, we've gotten used. So the question then becomes, how do we adapt and how do we change our behaviors consistently? Are we gonna be washing hands all the time? Are we gonna be getting used to wearing masks? Are we going to be uh, used to working online and at home? Um, most of the time, all these kinds of patterns of behavior then are likely to be stay with us longer. So disruption is good? I, I don't think disruption is, some disruption is good. Um, you know, people talk about going back to normal. Uh, the normal wasn't normal. The normal wasn't good. We don't want to go back to that. It, as I said, it's revealing so much about the vulnerabilities and problems in our system, the fact that millions of people do not have $400 in savings in case of emergency is unacceptable. That's not a normal. The fact that in California, a third of people are working for less than $15 an hour, a lot of them with bachelor degrees. So it's not the lack of education. That's not normal. So I don't want to go back to normal. We need to create a new normal. 